A little over a year ago, I built my first radio telescope with a lot of help from my friend Artem over at the Artlov. It was based around a satellite dish, which we'd motorized with the help of some 3D printed gears and some fairly MacGyver engineering. It took almost a month of work, and when all was said and done, we ended up with an image of the sky in microwave frequencies. The ring we could see was many of the satellites in the geosynchronous band, including Intel Sat 11, which was directly above us since we were in Brazil at the time, and that's their main TV satellite. It was a really fun project, and while the concept has a lot of potential, the design needed a massive overhaul. As I was thinking about redoing this, I got to wondering what it would be like to look at a different part of the spectrum. Wi-Fi, for example, is just radio at a lower frequency. So I wondered if rather than taking a picture of the sky, what would happen if I took a picture of a building? In theory, I should see spots where the Wi-Fi routers are. Another aspect I've been thinking about is that rather than taking images, a system like this could be very easily used to track satellites and pull data from them at higher downlink frequencies than is possible with the antenna that we looked at in an earlier video. This has the benefit of providing much higher resolution images and also a wealth of otherwise inaccessible data. We actually attempted this with the earlier radio telescope, but it wasn't very maneuverable, so we could never really get it working. Full disclosure, I haven't taken any Wi-Fi images yet or pulled anything off the satellite, as this has been a very long build. I actually stayed up all night on Saturday working to get this at least partially motorized for the sake of the video. So this week we'll be covering the first part of the project where the telescope is initially designed and built. Next week we'll look at the electronics and software and using the completed rig to try and take some pictures as well as some of the other interesting applications. Fair warning, some changes may be made to the build by next week in pursuit of making this work properly, but I think we've worked out enough of the kinks that it should be mostly the same. So let's get right to it. This past week I've been spending most of my time in the Food Lab workshop building this rig and I've had a lot of help from the awesome people there. Before we jump in, I just wanted to say a special huge thank you to Paul who pulled an all-nighter with me to help get this moving. To start the build, I focused first on the antenna since whatever mechanism I chose would be built around it. I settled on a helical antenna for this first version as they're nice and directional and provide a large amount of gain while being relatively lightweight. I used an online calculator to figure out the dimensions by plugging in the frequency and how large I wanted the antenna to be. I settled on 8 turns of wire and set the frequency to 2.4 GHz. This works out to a coil that's about 4 cm wide, 25 cm long, and 3 cm gap between each turn of the wire. The disc it's mounted on should be 13.7 cm wide. However, I'm not sure I'll stay with this size of coil and may expand it slightly. I think 2 GHz would have been a better center frequency since it would be a bit more sensitive to mid L-band signals, but we'll talk more about that in the next video. After taking apart my prototype, I used the pieces as a guide to draw out the design onto some sheet metal for the base and some thin plywood for the supports. The supports need to be non-conductive, but the base needs to be metallic. The sheet metal was cut using a pair of tin snips, but as you can imagine, this left it with an awful edge and warped from handling. So first I flattened everything with a hammer and then it was time for some hand filing. One of the reasons I chose this project is because I knew that it was going to be difficult and well outside of the skill set I normally use, so I was going to learn a lot. And one of the biggest lessons I learned was patience. I did my best to file everything so it was reasonably round, and then cut the supports out on the bandsaw. Before I affixed the support, I need to drill a few holes in the base plate. The coil and base plate are essentially the two electrodes in this antenna, and they can't be connected. So the middle hole will let the coil pass through. That said, it's also a good idea to add some heat shrink tubing here so that it will prevent shorts. The other holes will be for mounting the support. I marked out where the two feet I'd cut in the supports were to go and then drilled them out to the correct width and then filed them square. I repeatedly filed and fitted until the support sat reasonably well. My bandsaw job wasn't super clean, so I used a file to flatten where the support sits on the base plate until it was less floppy. I also filed some grooves into the wood to let the coil fit through without being forced into contact with the base plate. To hold the base plate and support together, I marked two small holes on the feet and carefully drilled them out. Then I used some simple pins made out of copper wire to affix them together. I didn't want to permanently affix this as I knew that come time to do the actual radio work, everything was going to need fine tuning. So for now, while a bit floppy, this will be sufficient. I mostly need it here to simulate the final weight and balance of the armature so that I can balance the whole rig later. I salvaged a coax connector from an earlier failed radio project and soldered it onto some fresh 50 ohm coax. First, the pin is soldered onto the inner wire and then the housing is slid on top and the shielding soldered to it. My connector was a bit janky since it was being reused, so I couldn't get the sheath on top of the connection, but a fresh connector usually has better luck. A bit of electrical tape and this end is good to go. The other end is then soldered to the antenna. Strip some enamel off the copper coil and then solder the middle wire to it. Then solder the shielding to the base plate. And that's it, antenna done for now. Now let's move on to the mechanism that'll control it. 
When I was first drafting this, I thought the end product was going to be a lot more complicated than what I ended up building. I was really worried about the gearing because of all the trouble I had last time trying to haul that heavy satellite dish with such a tiny little motor. So for this design, I originally brought out all the stops, everything from no backlash worm gears to huge gear ratios on both axes. In the end, I simplified things a fair bit, though I paid for it in the amount of tweaking I had to do to make this work. The main structure is a platform that holds the antenna, a gear mechanism to move it, and a motor. This platform will be sitting on a second motor which will rotate it. This gives us our two axes of motion. For my build material, I wanted to use something readily available and cheap, so I went with PVC. Large PVC pipes can be extremely cheap or free if you find scraps, but with the help of a clever rig and a heat gun, it can be converted into excellent flat building material for projects. This is the jig that does all the work. It's two flat metal plates and a series of clamps that can be quickly slid into place, forcing the two plates together. First, a piece of pipe is cut to length and then cut in half to make it easier to manage. But slitting just one side with a jigsaw also works if you want larger sheets. The pipe halves are placed into the jig and then heated for a few minutes with a heat gun until they start to collapse under their own weight. Be sure to wear work gloves when doing this as the plastic gets hot and do it in a well-ventilated area as unpleasant fumes are released. When the pipe starts to get really soft, quickly drop the second plate on top and slam everything flat using the clamps and slider bar. Wait for everything to cool before opening it up. You'll probably have to do a second heat and slam to get the pieces properly flat, but after that they're very easy to work with. I made a pile of these pieces and then started marking out the sections I'd need. We need the platform itself, two A-frames to support the gears, a set of four interlocking walls and a base plate, the gears themselves, an armature, and then a few other odds and ends like spacers. Each piece was first marked and then cut out on the bandsaw to get it close to final dimension. Then a file was used to remove all the burrs and fibers to leave a nice clean edge. The interlocking pieces seemed to fit perfectly if I made three cuts exactly the width of this bandsaw blade, which was so convenient that they actually fit together tightly enough that I needed a hammer to get them back apart. The A-frames have little feet like the antenna support for mounting to onto the base plate later. After figuring out approximately how wide I wanted the gap between these two pieces to be, I marked out some slots on the base plate and cut them out with a bandsaw. The last piece I cut before the gears is the arm which the antenna is mounted on. The first one I cut ended up being a little bit too small, which I'll get into in a moment, so I used it as a template to make a larger one and then converted it into a cross support to help mount the antenna later. The notches again make everything just press fit together nicely and a little filing and adjustment with the bandsaw gets everything sitting where it should be. Last time I used a 3D printer to make my gears and while the printer itself was very frustrating, it was very practical and worked extremely well. But I did get complaints that not everybody has a 3D printer. I was going to try using the lab CNC cutter but we were having trouble getting it to work so while we figured that out, I decided to just do it by hand. This way I could show that this build could technically be done using only standard tools. Not that I'd necessarily suggest it, as this led to a lot of issues down the line, but the point being that it can work with some patience. I'll be honest, this was one of the most daunting parts of this project, as I knew how easy it would be to screw up, and have never cut gears by hand before. I used an online gear generator, which I've linked to in the description, to design my gears. As I mentioned earlier, I originally planned to use more gears, but after printing some templates and gluing them on with spray adhesive, I just dove right in and got to work. Since I was in such a rush to get started, I didn't notice that they'd printed a bit large at the time. To cut them out, I decided the scroll saw was the way to go, as I'm very comfortable using one and have made intricate pieces on them before. Off the bat, I definitely made a lot of mistakes and should have cut things proud and filed them to shape, but I decided to cut things to size and try not to screw it up for the sake of time. After cutting a few teeth on the large 31 tooth gear, I started on the smaller 10 tooth gear, so I could see if they meshed together reasonably. It was a bit rough, but seemed to be working okay, so I went ahead and cut the rest out. It was a slow process, but once I got the rhythm of it, it went faster, and before I knew it, the first gear was done, followed shortly by the second. I cleaned things up a bit with a file, and drilled a small center hole in each gear to help with the depthing and to act as a temporary mounting hole. These will get drilled larger for the actual axle later. To figure out the depthing, I set the smaller gear in place on some scrap wood using a small screw, and then put a small nail through the larger gear. I moved it around until it seemed to mesh reasonably well, and then hammered it into place. There were definite sticky spots, which I spent a while cleaning up with some small files. But after a while, most were gone and everything was running smoothly enough in both directions. It may not be click spring quality, but it'll do. It was at this point that I realized the gear scale issue. But when I laid my A-frame on top, I could actually see a really easy solution. If rather than three gears, I just mounted the small gear directly to the motor, it would fit nicely and the motor could be mounted directly to the A-frame so I didn't need to figure out a separate mount for it. It was a rather lucky coincidence and seemed to work out in the end. So I cut some small holes in one of the A-frames and got the gears mostly meshing. 
At this point I realized that I need a bunch of spacers to hold things at the right spot to keep the gears meshing properly, so I cut a few out on the bandsaw and drilled them out on a drill press. I also realized that the antenna arm couldn't be mounted directly to the main gear like I'd originally intended and needed a gap so that it wouldn't collide with the rest of the mechanism. So I cut a few more spacers, but these ones were longer and the same width as the arm rather than the small squares I made for the rest. With everything loosely held in place, I could mark out the hole in the second A-frame. With that drilled, everything was finally being loosely held in what would be almost its final position, but at this point I noticed a few issues. It wasn't meshing very well anymore as the holes had been drilled a little bit too low and things were starting to sit at a weird angle. The frame isn't super solid because it was just sort of being held together, and was made a bit janky so there was enough play in the mechanism that things would come out of alignment. This got worked out by the end though. Next I needed to join the antenna arm, the two large spacers, and the main gear into one solid piece. This was done by pinning them all together and then drilling two more holes through the whole pile. Then copper wire was put through, bent to hold things in place, and then gently hammered to tighten the joint. Then the middle hole could be drilled out to accept the final axle which I used a bolt for. The spacers and A-frames were then drilled to accept the new final axle, but I made a point of cutting the holes a millimeter or two higher which seemed to really help. Then a nut can be used to hold the whole stack together. Now it's time for assembly. The platform had a hole drilled in the middle and was fit onto the lower motor. Then the A-frame assembly was fit into place, adjusted until everything meshed nicely, and then hot glued to lock in the position. I also clipped off any excess frame that was sticking out of the bottom to help prevent crashes with the housing. Then the antenna can be glued in place, and two bolts covered in nuts were glued to the far side of the arm to balance it. Two square pieces of PVC were used to make a little platform inside the box to raise the lower motor a bit, so the platform was suspended in air and not rubbing on anything. One last hole was drilled in the side of the box for the motor cables, and then the motor was glued into place. And that's most of the assembly done. From here was just a lot of tweaking to make things work. For example, the counterweights needed to be ground down in certain places to prevent crashes, and the lower gear assembly got redesigned a few times as we were playing around with the electronics. As it turns out, taking this apart and putting it back together to tweak one thing shifts other things around which screws with the whole mechanism, so it took a while to fix everything and get it all working together. Once everything was working reasonably well, the lower gear was super glued onto the motor and held into it firmly in what would hopefully be its final resting place, though it needed to be re-glued a few times during the fitting process. As to the electronics that control this, as I said at the beginning, we'll be covering that more in the next video. Right now we've only got one of the two motors wired up, and it actually had to be switched out for a different one than the one that was originally here. Turns out, our driver board doesn't like 8 wire steppers and will only use 4 wire steppers, so instead of turning, it just turned it into an overly complicated vibrator. And as with any code project, even getting the damn thing to move was a nightmare. Right now it's all being run off of a Ramps 3D printer board, and we've set it up with some CNC software so we can sort of manually control it. So, so what did you do, Paul? <laughs> I, I, I set a value very, very big. I, I think you broke it. <laughs> I think I overrode part of this fucking memory. <laughs> God. So I'm going to go reset it now. During the all-nighter we pulled on Saturday, as we consumed more caffeine and the sun was starting to rise, the machine finally started to lurch and begin moving. And then it moved too much. It took more tweaking, but eventually we got it to the point of tracing a mostly smooth arc. And that's where the project is right now. This build was a ton of fun, and it's been great being back in the workshop. Most importantly, I learned a ton throughout this project. I'm actually using this as a testing ground of sorts. I want to work out the kinks in the mechanism on this small model so that I can build a much larger one down the line, as this little guy just won't have enough power needed for the more exciting applications. Next week we'll have all the motion controls sorted out, and we'll be starting to work on taking images with this rig and all the other exciting applications. I suspect this rig will be the focus of several videos over the next few months as it's improved and we get used to its capabilities. So be sure to subscribe and most importantly ring that bell to see when those videos are up. Projects like this are funded in large part by the support of my amazing patrons, so if you'd like to see this project finished and all the exciting projects it will lead to, then consider becoming a patron and supporting the channel. Your support at whatever level you're comfortable with is greatly appreciated and is why I'm able to focus almost entirely on making these videos now. So a special thank you to all my current and past patrons. Also, another humongous thank you to FooLab who provided all the material, workspace, and help I needed to build this. If you like this project and want to see more, be sure to like the video and share it far and wide. Now, if you'll excuse me, I need a long nap. So I'll see you next week.